I guess, first of all, you know, my story is just one of many, many stories here. That doesn't mean it's more special. I know a lot of people who lived in polygamy who had it way worse than I did. And as you listen to my story, I want you to remember that God is victorious. And um, he's my hero. And he led me out of a, an amazing situation. And, 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 you know, Chip said something today. I, I don't know if I could quote him. Um, but he said something that I went through some things that I w probably wish I would have never gotten involved with. Well, yes and no. Um, the no is because I have a lot of family still involved in it. The yes, because it certainly makes me grateful and thankful to my Lord. Uh, and I don't know whether I'm more excited to be here with you all today than, than you're excited to be here, but I sure feel mighty blessed. Anyway, I'm just going to kind of start at the beginning, and I, I, I tend to get myself off on little bunny trails easily, so I wrote down a few things to try to keep myself online. But um, I'm going to start just to remind you that I'm wonderfully okay today. I uh, think I have all my mental faculties pretty close together. And, um, and if any of you, as I'm, as I'm you know, talking, if any of you have a question and things aren't making sense to you, feel free, stick your hand up, and I'll try to get back to my story after I answer your question. And also, if you have any questions at the end, hopefully I'll get through this in time that you can ask them. Um, okay, I'm just going to start by telling you I was born into the LDS church. My mom and dad, uh, I was born in Richfield, Utah, not too far from here. And uh, my mom and dad were Temple Mormons. They had nine kids. I was the seventh of the nine. And I hate to tell you what year I was born, but it was 1953, a long time ago. Um, when I was four years old, I still remember the day that my mom and dad went to church and took all of their kids to church. Uh, in, I believe it was Marysville, Utah. And um, my, dad, they, my dad especially was having some major problems with the LDS doctrine. Different things, changes. Of course, I don't remember. I heard about that after I grew up. But, but I do remember that we went to church this one Sunday and my dad caused a major fracas in the middle of the sacrament meeting because they had announced that they were planning to change the sacred temple garments. They were going to be cutting them back from covering the wrist and the ankle back to being more user friendly, I guess you could say. And uh, my dad had a fit and he was kind of shouting around in the middle of the service and people were trying to get him to calm down and quiet down and anyway he gathered my mom and the rest of us kids up and marched us out of the building in the middle of the service. And um, that, that stuck in my mind for some reason, I think because I was sort of embarrassed that my dad acted like that. But um, we went home, didn't go back to church, and so my dad and my mom were prime candidates for a new little church to uh, send missionaries to their door. Two years later, these new missionaries had converted my mom and dad to fundamental Mormonism. And uh, we joined the Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times, which is one of the many Mormon splinter groups. And we moved uh, to Old Mexico, lock, stock, and barrel, everything we owned, we hauled to Mexico. And my dad uh, got this little adobe home and added on to it, so we had, I don't know, three rooms, something like that, in a little community called Colonia LeBaron. We had a new prophet, his name was Joel LeBaron. He was one of five LeBaron brothers who had started this new little organization, and Joel was the prophet of the five brothers. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about where they got their priesthood authority for those of you that are interested in that sort of thing. Um, Joseph Smith had, uh, I believe he was considered as an adopted son. His name was Benjamin F. Johnson. Well, uh, Benjamin F. Johnson, I believe, was 18 about the time that Joseph Smith uh, was killed. And according to the LeBaron saga, um, jo uh, Joseph Smith took Benjamin F. Johnson aside and gave him, in secret, the keys to the priesthood and, and told him not to tell anyone. And, and so Benjamin F. Johnson was supposed to have been told by God what to do with these keys on, further on down the road. Well, from what I understand, he never did anything with them but give them to his grandson, who gave them to his grandson, whose name was Dare LeBaron. 
And so Dare LeBaron, uh, all of his children knew that he had the real keys. And so they were given on to um, Joel LeBaron, his son. So Joel LeBaron received this revelation from God that he was to start a new church. So he went to Salt Lake and incorporated a new church, and this became the Church of the Firstborn. So my mom and dad were <clears throat> some of the first members. I don't know how many members we had at the time that we joined, but I would guess somewhere around 50 or 60, something like that. Um, yes? When, what year would this have been when Joel LeBaron started the Firstborn Church? I believe it was in 1953, but, and that was the year I was born. So it was just a new little church. Anyway, so we moved to Mexico, uh, moved into a little adobe house down there, and uh, everybody in the little community was all part of Joel LeBaron's church. It wasn't really a compound. Uh, people could come in and out. We had no problem with our neighbors, uh, you know, friendly with our Mexican neighbors. But we had no running water, no electricity, did our clothes outside on a scrub board, and I, of course, I had no problems with, with any of this. I was a kid, and I thought it was all fun. And uh, my dad took a plural wife, as was the reason for our going down there, so we could live the fullness of the gospel. Uh, I was eight years old when he took a, a plural wife, a little Mexican lady, about 30 years his junior. And she quickly began adding to my father's brood. And he built her a little house out behind our house, and so every other night my dad would spend at Maria's. So, you know, polygamy was absolutely normal to me. Everybody in the colony pretty much had plural wives, and the men were busily finding new ones. So, of course, I grew up believing that Joel LeBaron was God's one and only mouthpiece to the whole world. And uh, it was very easy to believe. When you hear something like that throughout your growing up years, of course you're going to believe it. Just like uh, many of you that have come out of the... the LDS Church, you know that from the time you're little children or you've seen the little kids get up and say, I know that Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God, and it becomes ingrained in your mind. And that's how it was with me. I knew that Joel LeBaron was a true prophet and that we had the only true church on the face of the earth. And our mission as a church was to go out to all the world and to preach the gospel. And everyone had to find their way down to Colonial LeBaron and be baptized into our church in order to get to the highest degree of glory in heaven. And, of course, they had to live polygamy. So, yes? Was there a certain age, like when the church eight? Yeah, we got baptized at eight years old. I remember the day I was baptized, and my toe stuck out of the water, and I had to be re-baptized. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway... Um, I knew, of course, from a young age that I would be required to live polygamy, and the thought didn't bother me. Everyone did it, and I didn't see a whole lot of problem with it. And so um, I was 13 when I got my first boyfriend, and he was uh, a married man. He was 27, I believe, and he had a little Mexican wife who hated my guts. And uh, this guy, he'd take me out to the movies occasionally and this and that, and my parents had no problem with this. That was fine with them. Well, um, we were kind of expected... Yes, I was 13. We were kind of expected as women to have a dream about who we were supposed to marry. And in our particular little splinter group, the women were not really told who they were to marry. They were uh, given the choice. Uh, because the way they looked at it is, you know, um, women only got to marry once, whereas men could marry over and over again, so the women should be able to choose who they want to marry. So I'd heard about other girls having dreams, and I kept thinking one of these days maybe I'll get to have a dream, you know, about who I'm going to marry. And sure enough, I had a dream. But it was actually a nightmare. And... Um, <laughs> And I, I, uh, I still sort of remember it was, you know, it was full of snakes and evil spirits and, and uh, people grabbing at me. And, and then this man came and rescued me and hauled me off and he kissed me and said my name. And I woke up with this amazing dream and all of a sudden I knew this has got to be the man that I'm going to marry. And so I told my mom about it and I swore to secrecy. And uh, she told my dad about, about it and swore him to secrecy. And um, pretty soon I had this man that I dreamed about come and ask my dad if he could court me. 
And he was the president of our 12 apostles. Our church was set up just as the LDS church is, with 12 apostles and this and that. We also had a patriarch of the church who was Joel LeBaron, the prophet's brother, Ervil. Anyway, so this man, uh, the prophet's youngest brother, Verlin, he was 38, and he had uh, five wives. So he asked my dad if he can court me. And my dad asked me, would that be okay? And I said, sure. The man of my dreams is asked, I mean, it was a revelation from God at this point. So this man started writing to me, and he didn't live in, in Colonial LeBaron. They were starting a new uh, colony out on the Baja California Peninsula, and he and his families were over there pioneering this new colony. So he'd write to me, you know, um, and I'd write to him, and this was our courtship. And he sent me a picture of him, and I'd sit and stare at it for hours and daydream about this important, mature man. Anyway, um, I got this summons one day. I was at school, and, and it was uh, this friend of mine told me that, that the patriarch of the church, uh, his name was Ervil LeBaron, the, younger, the, the prophet's younger brother, that he wanted to see me. Well, I kept thinking, what have I done wrong? You know, why would this man that I really don't know well at all, other than he was a hell and damnation preacher, why would he want to see me? So I went to his home um, after school, and um, he was sick in his bedroom, and I went in there, and he sat and talked to me for a little bit, about, told me about his basketball days and this and that. Nothing important. Couldn't figure out why he wanted to talk to me. And as I was getting ready to leave, he says, please come again tomorrow. I'd like to see you again tomorrow. So, and, and please don't tell anyone, and if anyone knows that you're coming over here, just tell them that I'm giving you endowments. So, um, I went the next day. And long story short, he finally got down to the point of why he was having me come to see him. And he said, uh, you know, you're just about of marriageable age, Susan. By this time, I'm 14. He said, you're just about of marriageable age. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about, you know, who you might be interested in marrying. And I didn't really want to tell him that his brother was writing to me. That was kind of a secret, you know. And so I just said, well, you know, I thought a little bit about it. And he says, well, do you have anyone in mind? And I finally told him, I says, well, I'm um, kind of, your brother's courting me. You know, he's writing to me. And he said, well, Verlin's a good man. He is, you know, his younger brother. He's a good man. But he says, what if I were to tell you that the Lord has had a revelation that you are to be my wife? You're, you're supposed to be in my family. And um, I freaked out, you know. I says, you know, no. And he says, I says, I've had this dream about Verlin. And he says, well, who would you trust more, your dream or my revelation? So um, he convinced me that I should let him court me. And he swore me to secrecy. I wasn't to tell my parents. wasn't to tell anyone. And so um, this is kind of the way it went. And he'd have me sneak over to his house. And his wife, of course, knew all about it. But I would go to his house, and um, he would visit with me and court me, and pretty soon he was kissing me, and, and it was really, you know, if I was a parent, looking back, I would have wanted to shoot the man, but this is what was going on. But this whole time, my parents, of course, knew nothing about this. He had me write to Verlin and break off uh, our courtship, and uh, long story short, he just about had me sealed to him in secret. In fact, I was supposed to have been sealed to him that very night, and instead, uh, red flags were going up in my head because he wanted me to be sealed to him without my parents' knowledge. And so this was just, to me, I, I just says, you're kidding me. You want me to be sealed to you in secret? And my parents have raised me, and I'm not supposed to tell them about this. And um, he said, well, you know, uh, your parents don't necessarily like me, and, you know, we'll just kind of break it into them easily. And so would you please come back here tonight? And I stormed out. And I praise the Lord today because Ervil ended up being a major problem in not just our church but in the world, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But anyway, back to um, the storyline. Um, so Verlin came back into town for our conference right shortly within days after the Ervil LeBaron thing happened to me. And uh, he found out, I told him about Ervil and what he had done, and he was very upset with his brother. Uh, I couldn't believe that he tried to pull that, uh, a, a fast one on him by stealing his girlfriend. 
And um, he had me sealed to him that weekend and married to him that weekend and with my parents full knowledge and approval and this was I was uh, six days past my 15th birthday so I go on a two or three day honeymoon that I won't bother to tell you the details of they weren't really pretty um, with with Verlin and he moved me back to uh, his home in Baja California and uh, his his first wife picked us up at the bus station because we took a bus back over there and she was not a happy woman. Um, she'd had no idea that he was marrying me. Uh, he, I guess he hadn't discussed it with her at all because she was extremely jealous. His second wife was at our ceremony. She had come to conference with her husband and it was, it was uh, this woman, second wife named Irene, that took my hand and placed it in her husband's and stood witness as uh, our prophet Joel sealed and as his wife for time and all eternity and this all just happened in a living room we didn't have a temple down there the plan was to get a temple someday but we didn't have one at that time so this is the way that our marriages took place anyway so he moved me into his family home in Ensenada and there were um, three other wives there one of them was a little Mexican lady and she wouldn't speak to me wouldn't look at me his first wife couldn't stand me I was a little 15 year old girl, young, nice looking, and uh, I was a major threat and she was not happy with her husband. Anyway, one of his wives, his third wife, was very sweet to me, treated me nicely. Other than that, I was just ostracized from the family. So that began my married life and Verlin had given me this little camp trailer out behind the main house to use as a bedroom and he instructed me to make myself useful in the main house with uh, the housework and the care of his, I believe it was 24 children at the time. And so I started giving piano lessons to his kids and helping keep their hair braided and, and you know, just did my chores. Um, but then as soon as I was done helping in the main house, I'd spend the rest of my time out in my little bedroom trailer, more and more confused about what my role in life really was because my husband was constantly gone. He was very rarely around, being as how he was one of the leaders of the church. He was either out in the States working to try to support his huge families, or he was on church missions. And uh, so he'd, his, his habit was to come home to see his families uh, about once a month, and he'd spend two or three days, and of course, I was wife number six. So you can see I didn't have a lot of time with my husband. Yes. Um, his oldest son was a few months older than me. And, and then, of course, he had babies, lots of them. So it was, uh, you know, a gr I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was expecting my life with my husband to be an adventure. And I, being as how he was a, in the leadership, I really expected to um, be with him uh, to share the gospel with the world, and it was going to be a major adventure. And, and all of a sudden, I'm... A babysitter and and helping you know so it was really um, left a lot to be desired I was a married woman so therefore I was definitely off the dating market or the marriage market but yet I felt like a widow because I didn't have a husband and I would go out with some of Verlin's daughters okay pretty soon they got to be friendly with me the girls that were my age and but I was the married lady so they could have their their friends and their boyfriends and go to their movies but I being their age I was the married lady so it was kind of difficult you know anyway we ended up moving from the house in Ensenada on further down the Baja California Peninsula to the new church colony it was called Los Molinos and it was just out on the flats out by kind of by the ocean about two miles from the ocean it was really windy there and there were just a few old trailers and you know and I ended up uh, pregnant immediately and moved into an old trailer down on the Los Molinos Flats. And so uh, he'd have, you know, a little wife here and there around us. But four months after I was uh, married to Verlin, he immediately started the courtship of another teenage girl who had been a childhood friend of mine. And that became my first experience with jealousy. Um, my husband was, yes. Her age, I think she was 17. Yeah. Um, when I knew that he was courting Lily, this was her name, 
uh, striking brunette, um, that's when I really started feeling jealous. And I mean, I'd been trained to uh, look at men with nothing but respect. You know, as women, we were definitely second-class citizens. And the men were to be respected, and we, as women, kind of tiptoed around them and served them. And um, so when he started courting Lily, I threw a fit in front of him, you know, and that was very uh, uncalled for, uh, in his opinion, and he didn't like it. But he ended up eventually marrying Lily, and um, so I got my first taste of having him marrying another woman. And I suddenly realized why the wives before me didn't like me. And so Lily became my competition, and she was my competition all throughout my marriage to Verlin. Um, Verlin's first two wives were half-sisters, and they were from the All Red group in Salt Lake. And he had married them. And somebody had, uh, I don't mean to sidetrack myself, I hope I don't get off on a major rabbit trail, but Verlin wore garments because he and his first wife were members of the LDS church and they had had a temple marriage. And so when he uh, left the LDS church and joined his brother's new church, um, he continued to wear his garments and wore them throughout the time that I was married to him. I didn't really understand why he would wear garments of a church that he said was an apostate church, but he did. But anyway, back to my story. Let's see, where was I? Um, Right. The first wives were half-sisters, and um, they were competition for each other constantly. The second wife couldn't stand the first wife, and there was little comments made, and that's kind of how it was between Lily and me. And anyway, so we're living down in, in Los Molinos. Well, by this time, um, there was some major, uh, another major problem going on in the church besides my marriage and my unhappiness, and that was that, um, that Ervil the younger brother who was the patriarch of the church, he was also called the second grand head of priesthood, he, uh, he wanted to be the leader of the church. He didn't like, he didn't feel that his brother Joel, our prophet, was a strong leader. And um, he started wanting to take over the church. Well, there was some things that went on that, that caused major division and major split, and pretty soon Ervil split away from his brother Joel's church and took part of the church fellowship with him. Uh, one of these people was my, my aunt, my dad's sister, and I was very, very close to her and her family. Uh, her kids were kind of, they lived in Los Molinos during the time that I was there, and they were my only real family there. So when Ervil split away from the church, he took this family that was like my my, my new family with, with him. So it was heartbreaking for me to see this happen. But Ervil started sending threatening letters to Joel, to our prophet, and, and to other people. In fact, he sent some to the All Red group, and uh, from what I understand, also to um, the head of the LDS church, saying that he was God's mouthpiece to the world. He called himself Jesus Christ's personal representative and wanted everyone to start paying tithe to him and to accept him as their new leader. And when this, of course, didn't happen and everybody just kind of tossed his pamphlets in the trash, um, we found out that he was extremely serious, and how we found it out is he had our prophet, his brother Joel, murdered. He didn't actually pull the trigger himself. He had one of his, his right-hand man do this, and... Uh, and I just remember the day, and I was back in Colonial LeBaron when it happened. And my husband, by the way, was supposed to have been killed at the same time that Joel was. Irva wanted to hit both of them at once because my husband was, like, one of the leaders at this point. And, um, and my husband just didn't happen to be where Irva's people said they thought he was going to be. Uh, he'd left, we'd left a day earlier for conference in, in Colonial LeBaron. So... A conference. We had a semi-annual conference in our church, just like, church. yes, just like the the LDS church does. Two times a year. Or two times a year. Yes, and they, yeah, we'd have them in usually in um, October and April, just like the LDS church. So anyway, so our prophet was murdered. Well, this began my first real problem in my mind with uh, with our church because I mean, we'd been taught, and and Joel had claimed that he was going to be. He, on the earth uh, until Jesus came again, that he would be the one to uh, usher in the millennial reign of peace. 
So all of a sudden, our prophet is dead. And I remember uh, Verlin and I driving into Colonial LeBaron uh, on our way over to the General Conference. And when we got there, we received the news. And it was in the middle of the night. And the whole community, and I don't know how many people we had at that time, but probably there was probably a 1,000 members, but not all of them were in Colonial LeBaron. But uh, the whole community was up and with torches and flashlights and, and lanterns, you know, wandering the streets. I mean, just in absolute shock because our prophet was dead and we didn't know what to do, you know. And we, we thought that either the end of the world was upon us or that uh, Jesus, he was going to be raised up again as Jesus had been. That's, that's how... Uh, strong our faith was in our prophet. And of course, when neither of those things happened, we buried our prophet, and my husband was made the new leader of the church. It, not that he wanted it, but he was the president of the Twelve Apostles, and, and it was thrust upon him. So uh, my husband from that point had to go into hiding a lot of the time, uh, because they were worried that Irva would come and, and hit him next. And thus began what became a really a, a, a terrible time of uh, blood atonement murders committed by Irva LeBaron and his group. Yes. Was there ever a case in court for the murder? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah, the FBI was involved right from the start. And uh, they were chasing Irva LeBaron, and, they, and he and his group had gone into hiding changed their names. We didn't know where they were. We just knew that, I mean, our communities, both in Colonial LeBaron and in Los Molinos, uh, we had guards around our communities constantly uh, watching out for what we now knew as the Irvilites. So uh, anyway, so we lived in fear. We did, of Irville throughout the re remainder of the time that I was down there. But this is what started my questioning, the first little bit of question in my mind. And, I mean, of course, the general authorities of our church, they, they justified uh, our prophet being killed by saying, well, we probably were not righteous enough to have a man or a living prophet, this man with us at this time. Or we just didn't understand, and they tried to make excuses. So my husband was a new leader. And by this time, I'd had, uh, I, I had two children, and I was pregnant with my third. And um, Lily and I had sort of become friends. She, I had nothing in my, my new home that Verlin built me. It was a little adobe house down in Los Molinos, and I was so excited because I was finally going to have my own home. And uh, it finally got built, and I had cement floors that looked like this, and I had four walls and a roof, and I had absolutely nothing to go on the inside. Well, so Lily had uh, worked out in the out in San Diego area and had saved her money and gone to yard sales or somewhere and had picked up some furniture for her new home that she got just a little bit before I got my home, which wasn't fair because she'd married him after me, and so we had a major problem over that. But she brought me over some furniture one day and said, I, I just love you, and I just want to share what I have with you. And so that began me learning to care about my sister wife. And you know, um, when you have a bunch of women who are all married to the same men, man, and they're all in the same boat, basically, um, no one has it really any better than the other one has it, you learn to bond. You might not like each other as long as your husband's home, but you learn to work with one another, and we tried to be respectful of one another. Of course, tensions ran high, um, but it's not impossible to love and care for another woman that's married to your husband. Um, but you don't have to be married to the same guy in order to love another woman either. But Anyway, so that's, you know, uh, you hear nightmares of, of plural wives, and I'm just here to tell you that most of it is an absolute nightmare, but you do learn to work with one another. And um, anyway, right about that time, um, Verlin was gone for four months after Joel was, was killed, and he was in hiding for four months. And I mean, I was frantic, not knowing if I would see my husband alive again. And w was constantly watching the, the road to, for his truck to come and, and wondering when he would show up again. And um, I finally saw his truck pull up onto the highway into Los Molinos. And I was so ecstatic because I was going to get to see my husband again. And I watched his truck drive around the colony from one of his homes to the other one, waiting for my turn for him to get to my house. And he finally came in my door and he patted my huge pregnant tummy and 
informed me that he had to leave again that very night. And so I said, well, why? And he says, well, there's this girl up in the San Diego area that I'm interested in, and I've got to go to her straight away and convince her to uh, marry me before she chooses someone else. Well, I, I lost it again. I had a habit of losing it. I wasn't a very submissive wife. And um, I screamed at him, called him a skirt chaser. For any of you young guys that don't know what that means, figure it out. Um, but I, I just didn't understand. And he told me that I needed to understand that this, this new woman was God's will for our family. And uh, that I needed to learn to control myself and stop being so self-centered. Anyway, so he leaves my home, and um, I just was screaming at God, Lord, why do you love your men, children, so much more than you do your daughters? Why is it that they get to have so many wives to love them and want them and desire them, and we women, we have to sit at home with our children and be submissive, and we give our men all of our love, our very best food whenever they show up, and our complete devotion all to our husband. Why is it fair? Why do we not have a fair God? And I really battled with this. And I told him, I said, I am so miserably unhappy in polygamy, and I, I, uh, I need you to show me for myself. I need a testimony of, a, of it myself. And so will you please show me if it's right? And if it is right, I will continue to live it. But if it's not right, uh, I, want, I want to get out of it. So uh, right after that, we had one of the brethren of our church um, announce in our church conference that he was going to leave us. And um, he said that, you know, uh, Joel's being, Joel's being killed uh, had shaken his faith and that he had started studying for himself and he wanted all of us to start at this from this point on to study for ourselves what we believed was true and stop relying on the teaching and the preachings of our leaders. And then he started pointing at women and he says, each of you study for yourselves and know what your scriptures teach and stop relying upon your husbands to save you. So I was so miserably unhappy and so confused and I knew that I had to do this. Well, I had never studied the scriptures. I mean, you know, I'd gone through Sunday school and this and that, but as far as studying them on my own, I never had. So I went home that very night, and I lit another lamp, and I gathered together the four books that we considered scripture. And I looked, taught myself to use a concordance, and uh, being, polygamy being my biggest trial, that's where I decided to start. So, of course, I went right to section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So I had that one memorized. And I, I read it through, and uh, sure enough, no question, that was what was going to enable our men to become gods, and we as women were commanded to live it on, if we didn't uh, agree to live it, why we would be destroyed. And so I thought, well, there it is, no question about it. And I picked up the Book of Mormon. I had never read the Book of Mormon other than what it was taught, what was taught to us in Sunday school. And you got to understand that as women, we were taught that as long as we were uh, supportive of our husbands and submissive of our husbands, that basically we would ride to heaven on, their husband, on our husband's coattails. So we really didn't need to waste our time and take time away from our children and our duties to study on our own. But so I, uh, I picked up the Book of Mormon, and I was just thumbing through it, and I was just feeling choked up and upset, and, and I stumbled upon Jacob too. And I read through it and um, where polygamy was an abomination in the sight of God and that uh, God didn't like whoredoms. And then it went on to say that, uh, that he was upset with the, the men of his people who were breaking the tender hearts of his daughters. And of course, the whole thing had me, I was just on my knees sobbing. And the thing that hit me the hardest was that God actually cared about the tender hearts of his daughters. That struck me more than anything. But that began my real study and my real search. And, and from that point on, I just knew that there was problems in our church. Because how could polygamy be wrong? And at this point, I was sure that it would be. And yet the rest of our doctrine be on target. So I knew there was trouble. So uh, I started studying. And, and it, it took me... Um, I believe it was three more years and two more babies born to me 
before I finally got the courage to run away. But I knew that I had to leave because I couldn't bear the thought of my little kids growing up and living the way that I had lived and seeing my little girls get married. Yes. Um, I was 23 years old and I had five little kids when I uh, finally left. But I had to, and it was basically an escape. Um, my dad was heading out to Utah to see my older brothers and sisters that had never joined Joel's church when he did. Some of them were involved in the LDS church and some just weren't really involved in anything but their lives. And uh, he was going out to, to the States and he didn't have anyone going with him and I'd been watching for my opportunity. So when I found he was going, I, I asked him, I said, would you allow me and the kids to ride with you? And uh, just we just need a little trip just a little vacation and he said sure honey I think that'd be great I'd like the company so I packed up my suitcases and I knew that um, you know I wouldn't go back but um, packed up my suitcases and I didn't dare take much not that I had a lot to take but um, I prayed my way across the border and all the way to Utah and I didn't know what I'd be going to whether my brothers would turn me away and say hey you've made your bed now it's time you lay in it and we certainly don't want five little kids but they didn't do that my oldest brother I, t I took him aside as soon as I got there took him into the bedroom and I just fell apart in front of him and said I don't want to go back and he said I will do anything anything to help you to get out of that mess so um, yes Five, yes. Um, I had two girls and three boys. Yeah, and my oldest daughter was eight. And my youngest was, uh, I don't know, about ten months old. So, anyway, um, he says, well, does Dad know that you're planning to leave? And I said, uh, no, no, he doesn't. He's, we need to tell him. So we called him in, and of course, my dad was very upset with me because I was the leader of the church's wife, and he had just helped me escape and he was feeling like I'd betrayed him by not telling him but um, he said you're gonna have to get on the phone and, and call Verlin right off the bat and and I knew I had to do it so I did and I tracked him down he had to call me back but he did and and I, he said what are you doing in Utah and I told him I'm leaving you and he's oh don't be silly he said, uh, "Just have a nice little trip with your little with your dad, and and uh, enjoy your your brothers and sisters. And I'll be there to pick you up on Saturday." And I begged him not to come. Told him it wouldn't do him any good that I'd have made up my mind. But he said, "No, I'll be there on Saturday." And so he showed up, and uh, he pray promised me all sorts of things. You know that he would divorce his first wife legally and marry me legally, so that he could take me with him across borders and stuff like that. But of course I didn't buy into that and uh, then when when none of his sweetness worked he started threatening me that he was going to take my kids away from me and uh, I had talked to my brother before he got there and my brother had told me that women have rights and that was something I didn't know so um, I threatened him with the law I told him you've taken me across state lines since I was 15 years old and I can tell the authorities this and you uh, better leave me alone so he did he went away and it was a sad deal you know seeing my because I did I cared about the guy he was for for being a polygamist he was a pretty straight-up guy you know but um, anyway that's that was how I got away from there and you know I was completely naive I'd never used a microwave before uh, I didn't have an education so the whole thing was new to me and uh, I thank God for welfare my brother let me stay with him for a couple of months and I immediately got a job as a waitress and I started going back to school uh, got going to school night school and I got my high school diploma and so I did the best I could but I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't have had uh, government help at the time so um, I was just totally lost didn't know what I believed in anymore truly didn't believe that uh, the, the the Mormons were right but I'd been taught something that that really messed me up from looking anywhere else and that was that all other churches are an abomination in the sight of God so of course I wouldn't look anywhere else um, I finally ended up getting baptized into the LDS church but I didn't get baptized there because I believed it was right I just needed something to belong to that was the only thing I knew and um, 
started going to church there. My oldest daughter was baptized there. But I finally just quit going because it just was too painful. I was hearing doctrines that I knew weren't right. So I quit going there. And um, it took me about three years before I, yes. So the, the LDS, the Salt Lake City Mormon Church and the fundamental Mormon Church, it was almost the same thing? The same yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely the same, uh, as far as I'm concerned, although, although we had a different prophet, but we had the same teachings, same books, same belief system entirely, other than the fact that we lived polygamy now, and they had put it off to live for some future date. So, that was the difference. Yes? Well, being as how I was born in, in Utah, and of course I had a, you know, I had a legal right to be in the country. My children were born in Mexico, but they were my children, the, you know, the children of a U.S. citizen. So that didn't give me any trouble whatsoever. Later on in life, I took my kids in and got their papers fixed where they had dual citizenship. Did you call me speak Pardon me? Did you call me speak English? Yes. Yeah, I spoke Spanish too. I went to Mexican, Mexico schools uh, part of the time and church run schools part of the time and so my education was really kind of a mess, you know. So uh, it, meant a, it meant a lot to me to get a high school diploma and then I went on for about a year of college. But then I met uh, my husband. Um, he was from California. I never expected to meet a guy that would be willing to take me and a whole house full of little kids in, but um, he did. And he was a major blessing in my life. Um, he raised my kids. They called him dad right from the start. I'm not saying that we didn't have a few problems because I'd been used to being a single parent to my kids all of these years, but uh, it worked out so good and he really truly loved my kids and they did him. And I lost him a couple of years ago. It'll be two years uh, next month. But we were together for 29 years and, and uh, about Oh, a year and a half after uh, we got married, we moved to Idaho. And he had a new friend that he just met in Idaho that had invited us to, a, to his church. And so Dennis came home to me and he says, uh, this new buddy invited us to go to this little church over in Filer. It's a, it's a little Nazarene church. And I was scared to death to go to a, one of these abominable churches, you know. But I uh, took my kids and thought, what the heck, I'll, I'll give it a try. So we went, and it was so strange. I mean, I just spent the whole first service just staring at all these weird people that, that clapped in church and were totally irreverent. And, um, and they invited us to come back the next Sunday, and I really didn't think I would at first, but then I, I gave in, and we went back. And, and I started listening the second Sunday, first to the songs. They were so beautiful and so worshipful and I kept thinking, why are these people singing to Jesus? Why is every song they're singing to Jesus? But, you know, it touched my heart so deeply. And then the pastor started preaching. And his whole message was cookie cutter made for my empty heart. And um, sitting there listening to him, I was sobbing sobbing into my husband's coat next to me. And then when it was time for the closing songs, you know, we stood up again. My legs were shaking so hard, and I just didn't know what was wrong with me. But I just was so convicted, and I could hardly stand. And my husband had his arm around me, and I was just sobbing throughout the last songs. And one of the little gals up front, one was playing an organ, one was playing a piano, and one of the little gals uh, uh, came down. And she could see me crying, you know. And she came and put her arm around me, and she said, are you okay? Do you need to pray about it? And I said, well, I don't know, you know. And she says, well, come with me. And she led me up front to, an, to the altar. Well, I'd never seen an altar before. I didn't know what they were for. But um, she knelt there with me, and the pastor came over, and they prayed with me, and led, they led me through the sinner's prayer. And I accepted Jesus as my Savior that day. Yeah. And you know, it took me a long time to really know what I had done. But I remembered back 
Um, my husband's sister, one about the only sister that he had that was part of Joel's church, her name was Esther, and she played the piano usually through our services. But Esther was considered a very, very righteous woman. You know, she did everything right, and, and everybody looked up to Esther. And I heard one time, um, not long after I was married to Verlin, I heard that Esther had her calling and election made sure. And she knew she w had been given this patriarchal blessing, and she knew that she was going to be going to heaven. And she was going to be able to spend eternity with God. And I remember looking at her and thinking, oh, my goodness, how would it be? to have that knowledge. And you know, after I became a Christian, it took me a while, I don't know, two or three months maybe, before I realized and people showed me the scriptures that, that taught me that I could know that I was going to go to heaven, that I could have that knowledge. And that is when the weight of my mental scale of, have I done enough good to make up for all of the bad things I've thought and done? finally lifted away from me and I knew from that point on that I was going to go to heaven so that's most of my story you know I mean from there I've just uh, it was a growth period a lot of time uh, trying to yank the Mormon teachings out of my brain and to figure out which book was that scripture out of is that a biblical scripture or is that something I heard out of the Pearl of Great Price or something, you know? So there was a lot of confusion for a long time. And I just praise the Lord today that I am completely free and uh, that I'm here. Yes. How old were you when you accepted Jesus that day? I think I was, let's see, 27? Yeah. Today I have, yes. Do you know what happened to any of your other sisters? Yes, I know. What happened to him? Um, Ervil the Baron was finally captured, and he was captured for the murder of a rival fundamentalist uh, leader in Salt Lake. He was in All Red, and uh, it was one of my my aunt Thelma, who had left and become part of Ervil's church. It was her daughter, so my cousin, that was a trigger finger on this man. She's admitted it. But that was all really hell for me. You know, it, it got to the point when once I got away from Colonial Lamar and I didn't want to have anything to do with anyone for a long time. Couldn't stand to think about it. But um, to answer your question, yes, um, I've been, I was back down in Colonial Lamar in 2004 and I took pictures for my book. Of course, I haven't told you everything. Couldn't begin to here today. But um, I've written about it in, in a book. I, I called it His Favorite Wife. Yes? Why did you name it His Favorite Wife? You weren't, or were you? Well, I got accused of being his favorite wife a lot. Yeah. Um, to say that I was his favorite wife is pretty ridiculous, actually, because I was a child. He was an adult. But I think that the reason I got accused of being his favorite wife is because he never felt secure with me. I was never submissive like the other wives, and I never seemed happy, and he was constantly worried that I was going to leave him. And so, therefore, he paid more attention to me, I think, than he did some of the other ones. Also, I was one of the youngest ones and probably the, the cutest one back when I was young. So I got probably more attention than some of the other ones did. But um, the subject, who's so-and-so's favorite wife, and oh, I just know that she's his favorite wife, uh, that that conversation goes on a lot in polygamous communities. So I thought it was a fitting title. Yes? From your unique story and perspective, how would you say is the best way if we were to run into a practicing polygamist, how could we best reach out to them, to the gospel? You know, um, I've shared with several of you, Jamie and some of the other ones, if I would have had any idea that there was anywhere else to turn when I was a miserable little polygamous wife, I would have listened. I really would have. Because I, I, I don't know, personally, this is just my experience, I think that uh, although the, the polygamous people are more trapped in some ways because they have huge families and how are they going to support them, um, 
I think they're also hungrier because they're so unhappy. They don't have a normal life. And I really think that if I would have heard the gospel, someone to take me, sit me down and show me that I could be saved and that I didn't have to live this way and that this was not required in heaven, that God the Father in heaven didn't live polygamy, that it was a lie, I think I would have escaped many years ago. But I never did. I never had anyone come to me and tell me that. Yeah. Yes, um, you know, everybody has their journey. I, I had, uh, after I became a Christian, I walked really closely with the Lord for some time. And although my husband was never really that supportive, he'd come to church with me once in a while, um, I never had that walking with him experience that uh, hopefully most of you have with your mate. So I was kind of alone with my children doing this. And then I had a real bad experience with um, um, a Christian pastor and his wife that I won't go into here, but it really shook my faith for several years to where I just gave up on it. I mean, I didn't give up on God. I gave up on my walk. So I think, you know, some of us have gone through experiences similar to that. Um, I would say the last maybe 10 years, I have just grown in love and closeness, and it's been a good walk. Um, bounced a little bit around church-wise because we've moved from one place to the next. But more than anything, the thing that's changed my mind and changed my life is joy. Um, fellowship with other Christians, realizing that I can have a personal relationship with God and that I do have one. And that I don't have to go through authority figures to get to the feet of Jesus. That I can have this, this wonderful personal relationship with him. And that I can serve him because I love him. Not because I have to in order to pay my way to heaven. So uh, that would be the, the biggest thing. And also the absolute knowledge that I'm saved. That's the big deal. You know, I really think that throughout my, my life as a fundamentalist Mormon, um, not knowing whether all of my efforts, and every time I was nice to my sister wives, and which was most of the time, and, and uh, subservient to my husband, and doing, you know, everything that we were told that we had to do, uh, I never knew. I never knew if it was enough. And I always really didn't think that I was ever going to make it. The fear of hell hovered over me all the time. So not to have that hover over me anymore and to feel this joy and this knowing that if I were to die tomorrow, that I would go to heaven has been the biggest change in my life. Yes. That's okay. You're welcome. Oh, that's a major problem. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I think that, that a man is much, much harder to deal with um, because I, I truly believe that the men are as trapped as the women are. Um, They've been taught that from the time they were small, just like the women, that they had to marry more than one woman. And, and by the time they're old enough to really start getting any knowledge into their heads, they're pretty much trapped. They've got women that they're responsible for and that they usually care about, um, children, bunches and bunches of them, and they're trapped. They're just as trapped as I was. Um, how to deal with them? I, uh, share, share Jesus with them. I share the truth with them just like we would with anyone. You know, uh, let them know that that they uh, that, that Jesus is the the way, the truth, and the life. And I I don't know. Uh, any anybody else have any ideas? Yes. I was wondering, uh, in regard to that, 
seems like there probably would be a little bit increased uh, difficulty with the fact that the, the, the pride issue. Yeah. Being, uh, Man, uh, polygamous. Authority and all that. Yes, I, I, I really believe that priesthood men are arrogant, most of them. Um, they don't want to hear the truth, and but but that's kind of goes with in the ballpark of, of most uh, Mormon and fundamentalist Mormon men. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, she brought up a good point that there's a good one to share. And this is, uh, this kind of answers your question over there, the, the gentleman. You know, um, after I left my husband, and of course, he, for being a polygamous man, he was pretty decent. He didn't try to take my kids away from me. Um, came to see him. A lot of the times that he came to see them, I really think that he was coming to see me, hoping that he could convince me to go home. And that, that continued until I remarried. Um, but he came to see the kids right soon after I remarried my husband. And my husband, of course, didn't like him much. And so he was, <laughs> he was hanging out in the backyard. And, and um, Verlin said, Susan, will you just promise me something? And I said, what? And he said, will you promise me that you will uh, see that these kids find the truth out there in the world somewhere? And that seemed like a really amazing statement to me at the time. You know, uh, I was very uncomfortable having him there seeing my kids when my husband was not happy that he was there. So I just couldn't wait for him to kind of shove him out the door. But he did make that statement to me. And I never forgot it. I always thought, you know, he's questioning his own church now. He's questioning. Back to Erville LeBaron, the, the bad guy in the LeBarons. Um, the little woman that was in his home as he was courting me, it was her home that he was staying in. Um, she was part of his group for many years during all of the murders that he committed. And there were close to 30 of them throughout the the country. One of them was his own pregnant daughter who was trying to defect from his group and he had her murdered. And uh, several of his children were shot, sh killing each other. It's a really a g gruesome story. If any of you want to read into it, uh, my book doesn't go into a whole lot of those details, but there's another one that does. It's called The Four O'Clock Murders. And you can find it online if you want to read it. And it's all about Herbal LeBaron and his uh, rampage of murder. But anyway, um, this wife, yes, just let me finish this. Um, this wife, uh, after Herbal was killed in, or died in prison, he died in prison in 1981 of a heart attack in uh, at the point of the mountain. Um, his wives, we of course, we didn't know what had gone on with them, but I heard through the grapevine sometime later, quite a few years later actually, that uh, one of his wives had married Jim Harmston. So she is still married to him today. And I, uh, of course, hadn't talked to her for many, many years, but I called her the other day, and Jamie and I stopped by and, uh, and saw her here in town. And I'm planning to see her again. And had quite a great conversation with her for the 10 minutes I was with her. But uh, anyway, it's I'm excited that I get to, you know, talk to her and reach out to her. Yes. Um, I, through the years, have gotten to know some of Erville's kids. Uh, these are his young, younger kids that never really were involved with his murdering people. These were just the little kids. And I've got to know them, and there's several of them that are amazing Christians today. One of them is a speaker for women of faith, and she's Erville's daughter, and she's also the daughter of this woman that lives here in town. So, yes, you had a question. Uh, the Lost Boys, and did you have a secret name that, like the Salt Lake City Mormons do? No. No secret names, and Colonial Baron, we didn't deal in Lost Boys at all. Ours was a different splinter group, and we valued our young men. Um, our young boys, like my brother Jay, uh, that was just older than me, he was told to go out into the world and convert himself, his first wife. And then after that, he would be worthy to take a girl who had been church-raised 
for his plural wives. So, yeah, lots of different splinter groups. Most of us believe uh, a lot the same, but, but have different little, you know, directions that we went with stuff like that. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Um, what's your attitude toward the, main, the mainstream church? It seems like the traditional, the traditional mainstream church is in some way responsible for all these breakout groups. Yes. In some sort of indirect, at least way. What's your, what's your heart toward the mainstream church in relationship to the <laughs> kind of out of sight, out of mind, I don't want to think about them anymore? Well, I think that the mainstream church is... Uh, kidding themselves and their 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 people by refusing to take any kind of responsibility for the polygamy groups that are out there because polygamy started with the mainstream church started with Joseph Smith himself and uh, was taught and lived by many of their uh, presidents and many of their people and it's still in the doctrine and covenants today that polygamy is a must in order to get to the highest degree of glory in heaven and so for the LDS church to try to uh, pull away from the polygamy groups or to look down their noses at the polygamy groups for living their religion, uh, I think it's really pathetic. And that's how I feel about that. 